What's the ideal amount of games within a game? I don't mean mechanics, I mean literally a game about a game wherein the kids playing the game are acting out another separate game. Today's review is The Initiative from Unexpected Games and designer Corey Konishka. The code-breaking game has you and up to three of your friends hunting down clues in order to solve a bigger puzzle and in true Matryoshka fashion, solving an even bigger narrative puzzle as your games move along. The Initiative packs some interesting secrets inside our box, so join me for our spoiler-free review right now. Our unboxing today is going to be spoiler free, so I might gloss over certain things as they pull them out of their cardboard home. The initiative's guidebook and key are first, both of which will guide you easily through how to play this one. The guidebook takes on the form of a narrative comic with a decent enough story to tell, giving you prompts to jump around the pages based on what's happening at your table. The key serves as reference, giving you the more detailed specifics about the game mechanics, which we'll get into in a second. Past our game board, we have a classic FFG center channel insert, replete with the standard dark blue color scheme and featuring our four main characters, alter egos. Baggies aplenty inside house all the tokens, cards, and standees you'll need for a game session, and these all reveal the centerpiece of the initiative, the mission console. This Wheel of Fortune style plastic stand is going to become your best friend and worst enemy as games progress. Let me set up for a game here, and I'll show you exactly why. We're set up here for mission one. An introduction of sorts, but don't be fooled, this isn't a cakewalk tutorial. In our campaign, we narrowly won this one, and then proceeded to promptly lose the second. Normally, I'd start this how to play section with how you win the game, but indulge me for a second with the final bit of setup. This stack of large cards here is the mission deck, from which you'll receive your individual missions. It's vitally important that you don't ever flip these cards over. It will ruin the puzzle you're trying to deduce. The top of each card will show you which side of our double-sided board you want to use, and then where to place these adorable clue tokens on it. Once that's done, you'll check the top of the card for any special tokens, place those where denoted, and then carefully, oh so carefully, slide the mission card into the console face down. When you stand up the console, you'll then be able to see the prompt for this game and the glyphs you'll need to uncover, but not the solution. The object here is to find the listed glyphs on the console among all of the clue tokens scattered randomly around the building you're searching. I mentioned Wheel of Fortune earlier, and that's exactly what most of your games will feel like, hunting down glyphs until you revealed enough of the puzzle to make a confident guess in solving it. As a group, you decide to take one guess at the solution, and then you'll pull the card out of the console, revealing it. If you're right, you've won the mission. Get it wrong, as we hilariously did in one of our missions, and you'll fail. Either way, mark the back of your progress uh, on the back of the guidebook, and then move along in the story. Said story here centers around four high school students who discover a board game called The Key at a garage sale and decide to head back to a house to play it. The Key is actually what you're playing here at your table, role-playing, to a certain extent, the four kids in the story. Brock, Phil, Prathna, and Jenny each have their counterparts on the board, and as them, you'll have a hand of four cards that you'll use to perform up to two actions on your turn. The 36 cards in the deck are numbered 1 through 12 of three different suits, and while those colored suits will mean something to you later on, you'll most often care about their numbers. The four actions you have available to you on your turn are denoted here on these appropriately named action cards. By spending one of your cards to the stacks here, you can take the associated action. The first three are pretty standard fare. Run, which is just moving around the board. Gather, which allows you to pick up the clue tokens you'll need to solve the game's puzzles. And Intel, a very handy ability that lets you reveal tokens in a room you're not in to see what's on them. The fourth action is where the strategy of our game starts to take shape. Playing a card on the regroup action gives you the option of choosing another action stack and discarding all the cards and tokens on it. Why is that good? Because the only way you're allowed to choose an action is by playing a card to the stack that is larger than the card that is currently on top. In this way, the initiative quickly becomes a game of hand management, not only for yourself, but for your teammates as you struggle to decide where that six in your hand should go and whether or not you're cutting off your friend's only play. 
After playing at least one action, you can't pass, but you can skip your second. You'll draw back up to four cards. If doing so would cause the deck to empty, then you'll take these four time cards, flip the discard marker to in peril, and shuffle all the discards to form a new deck. Now, you're racing against these quality vintage Casio timepieces. Three of them show a single watch icon, while one of them has a double icon. As soon as you draw a time card, you must immediately reveal it. If doing so would cause three total time icons to be revealed, the game immediately ends in a loss. The initiative is disappointed in you, but you'll live to solve another puzzle. So, does all of this come together neatly? It does, but you'll want to keep a few things in mind. First of all, if you're a puzzler by nature, not because I hate you, then you may find the initiative solution a little too easy. We played through the entire story with the same four people, and we all consider ourselves to be pretty good at puzzles. We were only stumped by the combination of time and lack of information once, the aforementioned ridiculously wrong guess. Which is not to say we won all the other missions. Our final record over 14 missions was 10 and 4. Respectable, but not dominant. So what keeps the game's tension? Unfortunately, it's randomness. While this may seem like a simple race against the clock affair, you have to remember that sometimes you're going to be revealing glyphs you don't need. And those will hurt as you stare at the dwindling deck or your friend Ian who keeps putting seven value cards on the group's three value cards. The initiative will eventually introduce additional tokens as well, and sometimes you'll need to hunt the whole map just to find the one token you need to unlock some others. Still other times, you'll shuffle the time cards into the deck and immediately draw the two icon card. We had one game where we drew four total cards in the second half of the game, and three of them were the watches. Sometimes you'll lose a mission that isn't your fault, and that feels awful. Without spoiling the story, I want to at least attempt to make you feel better about that. Winning and losing missions matters, but know that you're going to lose some, and that's okay. Losing builds character. What really works for the initiative is the group strategy that inevitably develops over the course of a long campaign. Each character has a special ability that they can use by discarding any two cards to the discard pile, and you'll want to make copious use of those. Planning out a round of turns with your friends as each person analyzes where they are, where you think you all need to go, and how you each can get there, given all the moving parts, is a delightful puzzle in itself. And when it culminates in a moment of someone staring at a nearly complete but not quite puzzle and two revealed time cards and suddenly saying, Oh! I got it! There are very few gaming experiences that compare to that feeling of relief and admiration for your buddy. It took my group two days of four-hour sessions to play through the story, and we had a great time throughout. There's an additional 24 missions to play and a larger cipher to deduce from those, so there's tons in the tiny box if the individual sessions are your thing. The lure of more unknown puzzles to solve is also a siren song. Who knows what those solutions can lead to. If value proposition is what's worrying you about this one, you're going to be just fine. The initiative plays like an interactive comic, allowing players to step into the world of both games neatly while also providing incentive to come back after the story's done. Let's go through our checklist before I give you my final thoughts. In the box, rulebook clear and non-gender pronouns. The guidebook for the initiative is a comic book, which can sometimes be a little confusing as to what it's asking of you, but is overall well done and engaging to use throughout the narrative campaign. When referring to the player, it uses second person you and yours pronouns. Iconography clear. While it can be hard to remember which of the security systems denoted on the tokens does what thing, most of the glyphs you're hunting are clear enough to find on the puzzle card. Through 14 plays, we never once mistook a glyph for a different one or failed to match it up on the puzzle card, though I was absolutely certain we were going to. Packaging well done. Yes, everything fits neatly into the insert center channel design, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Because reasons. On the table, good representation. Our four player characters are represented by two men and two women, two of the four being people of color. The in-game characters are also two men and two women, two of the four, again, being people of color. Component quality. Fine. Cardstock is serviceable, and the game's punch standees will last your entire game as long as you don't take their plastic stands off. The punch tokens are also standard stock and will serve well as long as you don't tear them or otherwise deface their sides. Replay value. Unknown. 
While we played through the entire narrative before this review, we haven't gone back to the additional missions to see if they're as engaging as the story missions are. There's a larger puzzle to solve after the narrative, giving you a reason to come back, so if you really enjoyed the gameplay at the end of the story, there's more to have if you wanted. Fun to lose. Yes. Each mission is tense as you race the Casio watches in the deck, and once you reveal a single one, you'll find that planning out each player's chances and what they'll do is delightful. While there don't seem to be immediate consequences for failing a mission most times, be assured you'll want to win as many as you can. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, failing is going to happen, and it's not dire if you drop a couple along the way. The initiative worked really well in our group, and while we were able to finish the main story in just two longer game sessions, there's plenty left over in the box for us to discover if we wanted to go back into its world. The combination of quick sessions, interesting puzzles, neat tricks, and light strategy make this one well worth the time for me. If you're at all a fan of any of the escape room in a box style games, then the initiative is worth a long look for your group. I'm Nicholas, reminding you to help protect the game population. Always leave your cards. <laughs>